Um, and what people don't realize is that broadband is not just good for education, it's good for telehealth, and also for economic development. Um, so it's, it's part of our core infrastructure. The governor is using some of the dollars that she received from the first package through the SPARC program to bring back, bring broadband to some rural communities. But one of the concerns that I will have when I get to Congress is how to continue finding more dollars to come so that we could not only expand it, but the other challenge that we have is that even in the urban communities, there's a lot of kiddos that can't afford it. So we need to figure out a way so that we can ensure that there's parity with regards to access to the internet. Great question, thank you. So my opponent, uh, yet again, uh, misused his words. Um, uh, he lied. I've never talked about single payer. Um, I am a person that believes that if you have private insurance, you should have access to your private insurance. However, if you are an individual that does not have access to Medicaid, because you're a single adult, or because you make too much money to qualify, we should be able to expand those dollars that the federal government has had for a while so that we could have Medicaid expansion in Kansas and can help cover 150,000 Kansans that are currently under or uninsured. That's what I believe in. So the public option is already existent. That public option is Medicaid. The second is the expansion of covering those people that fall through the gap because they make a little bit too much money but still cannot afford health care. And that would be going through the exchange. But I don't believe in single payer. I think that right now we need to ensure that we are covering the people that are falling through the gap. Thank you for allowing me to clarify that. And by the way, I've never said that I'm for Medicare for all. I did say that I'm happy to reduce it to 60 instead of 65. But that would be just one vote out of 435. Don't get too excited. <laughs> you know, one of the biggest challenges that we have, and he's talking very eloquently about it, is that there certainly is uh, the, the Voting Rights Act was stripped. And um, there's a lot of tactics that are being utilized to suppress the vote. And if you have questions about that, you may start wondering, well, if Kansas has been able to vote by mail always, why are people being told all of a sudden that they shouldn't vote by mail? If you're looking at what's happening in Georgia, there's lines upon lines. Right now, we had to report that Nemaha County had one of their polling locations taken away. So suppression is happening everywhere. And sir, I will absolutely stand for our citizens to have the ability to vote and for it to be facilitated in any way that we need. Because it's our right. And for me as a woman to know that it wasn't until 100 years ago that I couldn't, and actually for me it was a little bit later because I'm a woman of color, um, is even much more important to ensure that every single person has a right to vote. So I will be a staunch advocate to ensure that our Voting Rights Act gets back reinstituted. And not only that, that also it comes back with the name of the Lewis Voting Act. Yes, sir. So I think that his question was a great question. He said, you were, born in, you were raised in Puerto Rico, because I wasn't born there. Um, he said, what is your view on statehood, not only for Puerto Rico, but for the District of Columbia? And um, what I would say to that is, I've been very clear that I'm not living in the island anymore. It is up to the people in Puerto Rico to determine what they want. Now, once they do their determination, it is up to Congress to figure out how to support that from going forward. And I think that the same thing with DC. If DC does a referendum and they're like saying that they want to be added to the union, I don't see a reason why not. You know, I, I'm very concerned with regards to how this is being sped up, um, especially as Americans are voting. Um, my only desire, and this would be if I were able to have any say in this, would be that the same request that President Obama had when he had months um, not to appoint somebody to the judicial system, that we give the people of the United States an opportunity to decide who their president is going to be, um, so that then that person could you know, make the appointment. Now, knowing that there's nothing else that I can do, um, it's not something that the Congress uh, will have any voice on, but you absolutely have a voice. 
every one of you as constituents of the senators of this great state has the opportunity to reach out to your senator and tell them how you feel. And whether that is, I would like for you to appoint Amy Coney Barrett, or whether it's, I would like for you to wait. And my encouragement to all of you is that you never forget the power of your voice. We are here to serve you. And if we're not responsive to you, even to give you the dignity of a response that is adequate, then it is your purview to do what you need to do to ensure that you have representation that does. I am, so if you want to hear my great plan for how do we bounce back from this economy that I'm starting to tell people, is what the, the thing that I learned, and just most recently in one of my classes, was that the PPP was helpful to bigger businesses, but to smaller businesses, not so much. And the overall impact was a cost of $300,000 per job saved, which is not great. Um, our unemployment numbers keep going down. Um, however, if instead of solely providing big businesses programs, as the federal government, we start giving monies directly to the counties and have the counties work with those small businesses and then expand unemployment so that individuals that were displaced from their low paying wages job can then go to a technical school and then get able to get an education in a field that we need employers in, our economy would bounce back much stronger. And we don't do that by sending people to four-year college. We do that by sending people to technical school. Um, because there's a significant demand. Advanced systems technology is a huge demand. Welding is a huge demand. Electricians is a huge demand. And not everybody has is, is got to go to a four-year college. Many of our students that do advanced systems technology end up having an $80,000 job immediately as they get off that technical school. And it's just six months to a year. So it's important, it's very important that we consider and continue to include technical schools and community colleges that are providing in many cases that first step for students that if they decide to go further, that's a great place to start. So I'm absolutely supportive of technical schools. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I'm happy to say, hey, you could put this much percentage in education, whatever way you decide to use it, so much in job development, uh, and, and you know, so much for nonprofit support, but absolutely, because that's one of the challenges. And, and it's not that I'm defending the governor, but she's only doing this because those are the restrictions that she's getting from the federal government. So his comment was, and I'm going to change it a little bit, but the federal government has become a predatory lender with student loans, right? It's disgusting. I'll give you an example. When I was homeless and I was trying to get my life back in order, I would make a $5,000 loan every year for like five years so that I could pay for my rent. And that was the only way that I was able to just like come up with the money to uh, match up at one point with Section 8 or to buy food or you know, at some point I had to get a car because I had a kid. Right now I'm paying over $30,000 on those $25,000 that I did years ago because they keep adding interest. And God forbid that you default because in my case I had medical issues and had problems that I was taking care of with my son. Now, no matter how much I pay every month, the number doesn't go down. And that is the case for so many people. If we, we cannot penalize people for wanting to better their future. Now make a loan and pay it back and do pay back a little bit of interest, but don't make it a predatory process. And right now, student loans are a predatory process. And trust me, I will be one of those people advocating because this is horrible. Thank you. The state of Kansas is number three in, in wind energy. I support us figuring out how to continue providing incentives so that we can grow our wind portfolio, but also providing research and development so that we can store that wind at the transmission level. The problem that we have is that we have renewables, um, but we don't have a way to store them. So they happen and they're gone. They happen and they're gone. And in order for us to have an infrastructure 
that allows us to continue dropping down carbon emissions, the research has to happen for storage. So my, my interest is, yes, absolutely, continue providing education in these green areas, but at the same time, our research has to be in storage, and we need to figure out as the federal government how to provide incentive programs so that um, when you have cities, if they're able to start transitioning into a more green fleet, they have incentives to do so. Um, because in the end, everybody wins that way. So I'm absolutely concerned about our environment. You could ask our farmers about last year with all the floods um, and the fact that it's almost November and we're out here with jackets. Something's not right. Um, some people choose to call it climate change, some people don't want to call it that, but we know that something is happening. And we need to deal with it, and we need to deal with it swiftly. Um, but, but those are more my ideas, and it's because I come from the energy industry in my background as well. And I know that we could make that happen if we, if we crack that nut, and we're able to make solar panels a little bit more inexpensive. We would be well in our, in our way. But storage is crucial. So he's, he's talking about the fact that he has a cooperative that controls here locally, um, telephone, internet, um, and, um, and one more thing that you said, and cable. And um, they are being protected from entry from other companies to do competition, and you guys are getting stuck with a much higher rate. I don't know what protections they have, so one of the things that you learn about me is that when I don't know something, I don't lie. Um, so I would have to find out some information. Greg, if you could get me some information on that, um, that would be great, because I, I did not know that that was your situation here. Um, and typically, there shouldn't be any monopolies. I mean, monopolies typically happen like with the utility, when the system is so big that it's hard for anybody else to come in. But there typically is no protections. I mean, if an, an entry wants to come in, they come in. So I would love to know if it's that there is a monopoly or if there's some federal legislation that is protecting them for a specific amount of time because they use those dollars to build the infrastructure. And if that is the case, which can happen, that has a sunset time. So we would have to figure out when that would sunset. And you're right, I will be here. One of the things that we've been talking about is how we're going to have a mobile office. So I'm going to be calling Greg um, at least like every, at least twice or three times in the year and be like, hey, Greg, we're going to set office over there. Where do you want me to sit at um, so that you guys have access to me? And I pray that by that time, um, we'll be able to have our Republican friends also join us because hopefully by then I'll be their congressperson um, and they'd be interested in talking with me. So, absolutely. This will not be the last time you see me. <laughs> okay, well, I know it's getting cold. I know it's getting late. I just want to tell you all how much I appreciate the fact that you made time for me today. The fact that you were willing to take a chance on this cold, windy day to hear my heart and to allow me the privilege of listening to you and your concerns and your questions. Um, this election is like none other. We have a great and grave opportunity. We can no longer allow for people that do not represent us well to stay in office. We have to stand up if people are not bringing us together, not calling us to be kind, and not bringing out the best of us, we shouldn't vote for them. So your Republican brothers and sisters need to hear that there's people that don't care about the party, that they should not be trapped in the one or the other choice, that there's a third option, which is just vote for people, period, who have good character and that will work for you, and that do it not by saying it, but by showing up. So please engage with your brothers and sisters. Don't let the rhetoric of the negativity that you see online consume you. That's not who we are. We're better than that. She deserves better than that. Let's teach a future generation that we value kindness, respect, and integrity in the 2020 election and in every election that comes. I need you, get fired up, get ready to vote, because in 17 days, we're gonna make history. Thank you, God bless you.